So welcome back to, this is actually the last lecture on the regular languages. This is on what's called the pumping lemma. Um, so uh, we're actually, this is after today, we're done with regular languages. And after homework one, you're done with regular languages as well. They're only interesting as a toy model, personally. Uh, there's a lot more you could talk about. You could spend a whole class maybe on regular languages. But I, they're just interesting as a warm-up, personally. Um, other people, like other times this course has been taught, you can spend the first seven lectures of like a full semester, maybe more, 10, who knows, on just the regular language. You can spend half the course on them if you want. There's, just, there's a lot of things to do there. But I like going fast, and you maybe, maybe have noticed we're going a little fast. The pumping lemma is basically a proof technique to show that a language is not regular. So um, we're going to use uh, the pigeonhole principle on uh, a DFA to prove some structure about the DFA to prove that a language uh, is not regular. So recall, what does the pigeonhole principle say? The reason I want to stress this is because everyone kind of misstates the pigeonhole principle. I see this even in papers. Uh, like, it's not an incorrect application necessary, but an incorrect definition. So let's, as a lawyer, do you guys remember what the definition of the pigeonhole principle is? Is it like given x pigeonholes and some n pigeons? find the minimum amount of pigeons in each pigeonhole by some Kind of. I mean, like, there, there are definitions which aren't technically correct, but there are, they're still, like, usefully correct, right? So given, so uh, given uh, P uh, pigeonholes and uh, P plus 1 pigeons, uh, there exists a hole with more than one pigeon. This doesn't say that there is a pigeonhole with two pigeons. This doesn't say that there is a pigeonhole if you saw anything about the randomness of the way you assign the pigeons. But just as a, as a total technicality, any way you could put the p plus 1 uh, pigeons into p holes, think of any strategy, greedy or anything. It doesn't say anything about the strategy. But it says no matter what way possible, it's a purely combinatorial statement, no matter what way possible, there exists a pigeonhole with more than one pigeon. You could put every pigeon, by the way, p plus 1 pigeons into one hole, and you would have p minus 1 empty pigeonholes and one hole with really crowded with people's one pigeons, that's still true by the pigeonhole principle. If you consider putting the pigeons evenly, there's still going to be one with two pigeons at least, right? So this is what, I like to stress this because this is exactly what the pigeonhole says. There are slightly variations, people think it what it says, which is, they're not technically wrong, but it, they, I mean, they're technically wrong, but they're not usefully technically wrong. Um, right, so we're going to do something similar uh, with a DFA. So a DFA, a DFA has... Uh, finitely many states. But computes on arbitrarily arbitrarily long strings. Not infinitely long strings, uh, but the strings can be of arbitrarily long length. You can have a DFA of three states, and you can give it a string of length 100. So by the pigeonhole principle, consider a very long word on a very short DFA. The sequence of steps of states visited
uh, during this computation, the sequence of states visited during this computation uh, by a pigeonhole must contain a repetition. So think of a DFA and think of a very long word on the DFA. Consider the list of states that the, DFA, at the computation goes from Q1, Q7, Q2, Q4, whatever. It does some jumping around. If the word is long enough, it doesn't, it doesn't have the ability to visit a new state each time. It's going to have to repeat some state. So as a subset, suppose we look something like this. You do some computation. You get to some state. You view some string x. Uh, you, this is the first time you visited this state. But as you perform some other computation, you somehow visited the state again. The string between the two visits we'll call y. And then by the time you reach some accept state, we'll call this z. Something like this, right? So if the string is long enough, through the path of states, and maybe there's states here all along the way, just consider th three big states or whatever. There's some state that has to be repeated twice if the string is long enough. That's the idea of the pumping lemma. If you can visit y twi this state twice, you can visit it any number of times. So like if uh, x, y, z is an L with conditions, and we'll enumerate exactly what those conditions are. So if this string is an x, y, z, if x, y, z is, a, is, is a, a string, and x, y, and z are just the three parts of this string, if x, y, z is an L, that means there's a path to go from the start state to the accept state for x, y, z, right? x y, z, then x, z is also in L, x, y, y, z is also in L, and so on. You can go x, y, z, but if this structure exists inside the DFA, you can skip the y part. You can go x, z. You can go x, y, y, z. If there exists a loop anywhere at any point that you visit, doesn't matter how many states are in this loop. This could just even be a self-loop. You could visit the same state twice. You can go x, y, z. You can go x, y, y, z. And certainly, you could take this loop-de-loop -loop on the roller coaster any number of times. So if x, y, z is an L, uh, then for all i uh, that is a natural number, then x, y to the i, z is an L with some conditions. So basically, if the string, if the language is regular, then the strings in this language uh, that are long enough, you can take some substring of them and copy and paste them into it several times. You can pump the substrings. So if a language is regular, you can pump substrings. of uh, the strings in the language. Does that make sense? Is that believable, perhaps? You, again, we'll, we'll, we'll characterize exactly when this is true, but if you have a DFA of length 100, excuse me, a string of length 100 and a DFA of like size 3, uh, there's going to be some kind of loop that has to happen because you're not going to run out of states. It's going to only go to the states that are in the DFA, the three states, and it's got to go to some of them. So there's going to, be, there's going to exist a repetition. So if some string is said to be in the language, then um, then so are all these other strings, right? Again, uh, just in a small detail, this is only true if the language is, is infinite, but we only care about the infinite Languages as well. Yes. So, is it like we can find substrings using like loops, or there exists a substring somewhere that will be repeated? Yes. That can be repeated. Yes. Okay. And this is proven by the pigeonhole principle. Yeah. So, well, let's 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 give the characterizations. 
So let, um, uh, like, uh, let, let uh, S uh, be a string with uh, uh, the length of S is greater than or equal to P. And let a D be a DFA with uh, P uh, states. So, by the way, if you have a string of length P, uh, you when you run a, D, a string on the on the DFA, you're actually not looking at the states. The states is just where you land. When you look at the string itself, you're actually looking at the transitions between the states. So, when you have uh, something like this, this is three states with two transitions. Right, so when you run the the string on the word, it's you know it's you have to be careful when you talk about the p plus one pigeons to the p pigeon holes. Here we're actually concerned with a repetition in the sequence of states, but it's going to be exactly when s is not uh, p length p plus one, but s is length p. Is that just because the start state is like exactly yeah you have to start somewhere so that's like it's like counting from zero counting from one that's all it was. So like the execution of uh, S on a D is a sequence of uh, P plus one states. But D only has P states by our definition here. So if you have a sequence of P plus one states, and you have uh, a, uh, a, defini- a, a DFA of P states, and there exists a repetition, right? Uh, so by pigeonhole, uh, there exists a repetition. So it's sufficient not to have a DFA of size 3 and a string of length 100, but a, DF- a DFA of size P and a string of length p as well. Turns out that's enough to guarantee a collision by the pigeonhole principle. Okay, so uh, let me uh, give you exactly how, how can we use this fact, though, to prove that a language is not regular. So, like, um, if a language is a regular, it is pumpable. Pumpable. It's not a word. I gotta write clear. Pumpable. Like the contrapositive of that is going to be um, if a language is not pumpable. then it is not regular. Showing that a language is pumpable is not sufficient, it turns out, to show that it's regular. This is not a perfect characterization of what it means for a language to be regular. It's just a kind of a one-sided combinatorial argument. Um, So we can actually use this kind of pumping trick to prove that a language that is regular that a language is not regular by showing it cannot be pumped. So if a language is regular, all the strings, and it's infinite, all the strings in language can be pumped. This is only for infinite regular. Yeah. Finite ones don't need to. Yeah. In general, we don't care about the finite languages at all. Yeah. So like, if the language is is infinite and uh, pumpable, excuse me, the language is regular, then we can pump it. All strings in the language can be pumped that are long enough, that have the pigeonhole satisfying condition. But... If there exists a single string which we cannot pump for all possible ways that we could pump it, then that's sufficient to show that the language is not regular, it turns out. So we can use this as a way uh, to show that a language is not regular through a kind of combinatorial argument. So students mess this up like every time because it's actually kind of, as a proof technique, maybe you know induction, you know uh, contradiction, you know things. The pumping lemma is actually, there's like 10 moving parts to it. So I like to write down a formula on exactly how 
to apply the pumping lemma. And then we'll talk about why it's correct to apply it uh, this way. So what you're going to do is first, you're going to give it, a, give it a definition of a language. You're going to assume to the contrary it's regular. You're going to try and pump it. And then you're going to show for all possible ways you could pump it, you fail. And because it's, because it's not pumpable, it can't be regular. That's basically, and you're, it's going to be a proof by contradiction to the fact that the DFA existed for it. So like, uh, step one is assume to the contrary uh, L is regular with uh, pumping length P. What that means by pumping, by choosing pumping length P, you're basically saying uh, the number of states of the DFA is P. You don't get to fix P because let's say you did assume to the contrary uh, L is regular with pumping length 4. What you, then if you finish the proof, what you would have done is you would have proven that there is no DFA of four states. There doesn't, that doesn't prove there is, there's not a DFA of five states or something, right? So you say for just general P, let the DFA have P states. When you show that there is no DFA for any P, you, there and you're, then you've shown there's no DFA at all. So that's sufficient to show it's not regular. So you have to keep P general. P cannot be fixed. P is, P is general. Assume to the contrary, L is regular with pumping length P. So it's the first step of every proof. Uh, you're going to choose choose a string in, uh, in the language uh, with the size of S. The length of S is greater than or equal to the pumping length. Why? By the pigeonhole principle, we said that you need, in order to have the kind of pumping collision that we want, you need to choose a string that's long enough then longer than the description of the DFA, longer than the number of states of the DFA. So choose one. You'll get a collision uh, exactly when S is length P, but feel free to choose a string much longer. This is actually the most important step of a pumping level proof because it turns out if you choose a good, choose a good string, you simplify the proof significantly. If you choose a bad string, you can still have the correct proof, but it just might be kind of long and boring. Um, uh, three, um, uh, for all ways to break uh, S into uh, S equals X, Y, Z. It's crazy. Uh, so you, basically, all ways to break it into these uh, pairs of substrings uh, uh, with uh, y, uh, the size of y is greater than 0. So basically, y is not empty. Uh, and then xy is less than or equal to p. So you list out all the cases of the ways you can break them into substrings. And if you choose a good s, you won't have many cases here. If you choose a bad S, you may have innumerably many cases. You may have a lot of cases to go through. Recall that when we said the string was pumped, there was just that there existed an S, and there, excuse me, there existed an X, there existed a Y, there existed a Z. But now we're doing the opposite. We want to show there's, there's no way to pump it. So you have to show for all possible substrings. There's no way to do it. So um, this condition has to be there because you want to pump something non-empty, right? Like every DFA, by the way, can always have a self-loop with the epsilon, right? That's kind of ridiculous. We want to pump something non-empty. We want to lift something in there that has weight. And we want the collision to be uh, the first collision. So, right, you're guaranteed that in uh, the first P plus one straight states, in your sequence of execution, you're guaranteed there to be a collision. We want that the collision just to happen at what we call Y, right? So we want it to be here. That's just so our XYZ naming works out. That's why we require that XY is less than or equal to P. So that's, that's why those conditions are uh, there. Then for each case, um, uh, we're going to say, I'll put it tabbed here, choose an I uh, that is not equal 1 and show that X, Y to the I, Z, is not in L. 
and then five, conclude. So if you showed it for all cases, then uh, it's not pumpable. The string's not pumpable. Yes? I feel like I heard it's not in L, but it says in L. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Very, yes. Very important. Right. The reason I wanted to write out a formula explicitly on like how to apply the pumping lemma is because the definition following the actual proof is kind of different than how you actually apply it. And this always confuses people because um, there's like a for all P here. So there's like kind of like a for all here. There's a choose an S. So you get to choose the S. So then there's an existence. You get to choose the S. But then you have to show for all possible cases. So then there's a for all here. And then for each case, you get to choose an I. So there's an exist here. So it's like, and then some of these are nested, right? So it's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts. People always mess up on what they get to choose or what they don't get to choose when they do a pumping lemma proof. This is the exact formula for a pumping lemma proof. If you follow this formula, it, you cannot fail, right? Um, it's basically the opposite of what we proved is a, is a condition that the regular languages have. So if you can show that a language is not pumpable, then it must, uh, then it cannot be regular. Right. So this is, turns out, a sufficient condition for us to prove that a language is not regular. Right. And these conditions, we've, we argued, come from the pigeonhole principle. These are the sufficient conditions that we need. Um, right. So let's just apply the let's just apply the pumping lemma proof immediately and uh, prove some languages are not regular. We're going to follow the formula uh, exactly. So do you remember the first language we said was not regular? Yeah, the one with primes, right? Choose primes was not regular, but there was other ones. Oh, yeah. there was a there was a more uh, there was a, more, a classic one. We'll say L is a to the n, b to the n, uh, n is a natural number. So what is this? This is like uh, we kind of talked loosely about how a DFA shouldn't be able to recognize this language because if you're reading it only left to right, you need to somehow store a variable. And like that variable would take log n bits, but like intuitively log n could be like a, a quadrillion billion or whatever, and your DFA is going to be a fixed size. There's always going to be a longer string than the DFA can count because the DFA has finite states. So intuitively, this should not be a regular language. This is actually the canonical non-regular language. It's a classic example. Um, so we can prove it by pumping actually that it is not regular by our kind of our, our combinatorial argument here. By the way, the pumping lemma is like sort of beaten into people, like exactly the steps to memorize and do it. It's not that important, it, I think, at least, that you understand how to do the pumping lemma. It's important you understand the proof of correctness of the pumping lemma about why it's true, why this combinatorial argument, why the structure of the DFAs allows you to pump substrings, of the, uh, uh, push copies of Y into there, right? Rather than learn how to prove languages is non prove la that languages are not regular. It's more important that you learn how to do, uh, you understand why it's true rather than just uh, mechanically apply it. So we're going to follow the steps of, of, of the thing here. So we're going to assume to the contrary, to the contrary, uh, L is regular with pumping when Two, we want to choose S. So what is a good choice of S here? You choose a bad S, bad things happen. You choose a good S, good things happen. We want to choose a good S. Why don't we just take like four A's, four B's? Ah, four A's and four B's. So you're saying A to the four, B to the four. I think this is not a good idea because we want S to be greater than P. So what you have to do is, and we don't know what P is yet. So what you have to do is choose it as a function of p. So choosing s as a function of p, there's really only one option here. e to the p plus 1, e to the p plus 1. That's too hard. I'm going to choose this one. So he said a to the p plus 1, b to the p plus 1. Uh, you have to check the two conditions. Is s in L? Yes. s is in L, by definition. Is s, uh, is the length of s greater than or equal to p? Well, the length of s is actually 2p. So a to the p plus 1, b to the p plus 1, I think the proof would be identical, but there's just going to be a plus 1 throughout the entire proof, it turns out. So you want a simple string, but you want one that uh, satisfies these conditions. You don't want to do, like, 
a to the p over 2, b to the p over 2. You don't want like a minimal string. It's okay to be extravagant and have some maximally long, ugly string. Uh, not ugly. If it's a nicer looking string but much longer than p, fine. That's even better, actually. So you want to choose an s that looks like this, okay? Now, what are the possible cases uh, that s equals x, y, z? Well, it's a good thing we chose... Uh, to have this nice big block of P's, uh, PAs in the front of it, right? Because we get to use the fact that XY is less than or equal to P. That, is, that restriction is, helps us eliminate a lot of our cases. So we really only have one case. It's going to be that X is equal to A to the... Um, too many letters. We got X's, we got A's, we got... Uh, we'll say R... And then we'll say that y is equal to a to the s. And then that z is equal to a to the p minus r minus s, b to the p. That's a lot going on there. Basically, what's happening is that a and x and y are just a's, right? So like, Because uh, the string is a to the p, b to the p, this has length p. And because x, y is less than or equal to p. Well, so, so note, note that, uh, that x, uh, I'll say subject to r plus s is less than or equal to p, right? Basically, what that means is this is the string for x, this is the string for y, this is the string for z. Yes. How is a to the r, b to the p, like the size of that less than equal to p, unless r is zero? Where? So a to the r, a to the s, p to the r minus p, a to the p minus r minus s is going to be just the remaining a's. Yeah, That's all that means. If b to the p has like length p, yes. then wouldn't that break the condition of the length of x, y is less than equal to p? Ah. What's another cool thing about the substring is you get to use the fact that xy comes first. The first digit of x is the first digit of the string. So xy is the prefix. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, xy. I thought that was xc. My ah, my bad. So that should say xy is less than or equal to p. Oh. So subject to the fact that... Uh, notice that, like, uh, y um, and uh, s is greater than 0... We need those conditions in order to satisfy the fact that the x, y is less than or equal to p and the fact that uh, the size of y is greater than 0, right? So we, cho we, we, we restrict r and s in that way for this, for this argument. Um, it's really like, there's, it, we're writing it like one case, but there's really a function of the number of cases as the size of p or something for any possible r and s that this satisfies, we're doing it like one case. But there are really several cases here, right? Um, but note that, would you guys agree that S is equal to X, Y, Z, and this is every possible case subject to these two conditions? Okay, I just want to make sure, because there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's, I have like seven variables, and I'm going to make sure everything's moving clearly. So um, now we need to choose uh, an I, right? So we only have one case, let's choose I. Uh, what i are we going to choose? We get to choose i here. Here we have to show for all cases. We get to choose s for all cases, and we get to choose i. i greater than p? Hmm? i greater than p? That is too hard. Sometimes that's necessary. Just to i equals p? Also too hard. I'm going to choose i equals 2. It's ridiculously easy, right? So choosing i equals 2, uh, x, y to the i, z is equal to x, y squared, z, which is equal to x, y, y, z. And that is just the subs, that's just as the strings concatenated together. That's going to be a to the r, uh, a to the s, a to the s a to the p minus r minus s 
uh, b to the p. Now there are too many a's, right? Yeah. So basically, there's an r here. We're going to cancel that one. There's an s here. We can cancel this one. And what we're going to be left with is a to the p plus s b to the p. So we have x, y, y, z is equal to a to the p plus s uh, b to the p, right? So there's more a's than b's. So since uh, s is greater than 0, because we can't pump something non-empty, s, by the way, is exactly the size of y. We quite literally, if you think back to our, our, our proof, by choosing i equals 2, we chose to go in the loop-de-loop -loop just one extra additional time. So we pumped exactly one copy of the substring of y in there. And that's enough to break the balance, because this string is actually quite delicate. Exactly the, exactly the same number of a's, exactly the same number of b's. You just put one more a in there, on the, and then it's suddenly not in the language. It's, you've thrown off the balance. So since s is greater than 0, a to the p plus s, uh, b to the p, is never going to be in L. Uh, therefore, L is not regular. So again, back to the high-level ideas here, we chose uh, A to the N, B to the N as our language. And well, we're trying to prove that language is not regular. By choosing S equals A to the P, B to the P, if the DFA has p states, we're choosing the number of a's to be the number of states. So we exhaust the number of states immediately only on the a's. That gives us a case like if we, had, if we were able to pump it, we could only pump a's and therefore throw off the balance. Right? If we choose a wrong string, it's possible you can pump it and keep it in the language. Uh, like it's possible that it's delicately pumpable in a way it shouldn't be. Right? Um, like if I did, uh, I don't know, something weird, like a to the n, b to the n, and then I put a c star in front somehow, let's say, that would be non-regular for the same reasons that this is non-regular. But like you could pump the c part, right? So you have to set things up nicely so they work out the way you want, you, they want, you want them to. So this is a proof. We can now conclude that this language is non-regular. And we've now proven that there exists a language which is not regular. Any questions on this proof? A lot of moving parts here, a lot of letters. We'll do, we'll do some more examples. Okay, let's do a second uh, example of a non-regular language. It's also a canonical example. It's going to be WWR. Uh, w is in sigma star. Did we talk about this language? Do, do any of you guys know what the name of this language is? If you have to guess what it looks like, kind of internally. Where's R? Oh, I didn't say, yeah, okay. My bad. R is the reversal of. That's very important. R is the reversal of W. Palindromes, exactly. It's palindrome. Actually, it's specifically it's even length palindromes. So it's. Wait, is it supposed to be like W W in like bracket and parentheses, or just like W and then W to the R? W to the R. So there's no delimiter. There's no way to tell if you're leading, reading it when you're at the middle. Is it like w is like a prefix, and then wr is like just the reversal of the prefix? Exactly. It's the like same it? thing. They're the same strings. So this contains like a, b, b, a, 
empty string a a a b b b b a right and so on uh, it's even length palindromes right uh, you split the string down the middle and then you reverse it again uh, kind of difficult if you imagine if you think about DFAs as constant space programs that kind of work in this limited looping you can't loop back kind of model you need to store it to, you could probably choose a really long palindrome that it shouldn't be able to recognize like it would have to remember the entire string it saw up to the halfway point flip it around in order to make sure it's exactly right otherwise it would make a mistake right with constant space so again intuitively this language should be non-regular and we can actually prove it using the pumping lemma so we're gonna the pumping lemma is just quite literally a generalization of the intuition we have about um, about the memory -ness. so we're gonna choose a really long uh, string so again let's say um, step one assume to the contrary L is regular with pumping length P to choose S equals, and let's give you guys a second to think about this one. Marinate on this one. Choose an S. This is actually a little tricky, a little hard. Well, is building this allowed to be anything? Can you just make it like a to the p, or like a ah, to so the p? Ah, so I claim a to the p, a to the p would be a bad choice. A that is a string. Why? Any substring. This is pumpable. Just choose the choose a choose y to be two, or y to be even. You can pump it in as long as you keep it even. It's pumpable. You want a string that's very delicate. You want a string that is barely in the language. Like any small perturbance to the string, any way you could pump it will bring it out of the language. So this one, it's unfortunate though that any way you could pump it, it can still stay in the language as long as it's not odd, right? But there still exists a way to pump it. So this is a pumpable string. So this is bad choice of S. That is also a bad choice of S. Oh, is it because you can just like cycle it? It's 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 pumpable for the same reason that a a a to the p a to the p is also pumpable. So these are these are I would say bad choices. Um, you can put a copy in there uh, of it. Right? So this one's actually a little tricky. You want a language barely in um, the thing. This doesn't have a, this has much more freedom, by the way, than uh, a to the n b to the n a to the n b to the n. You can only choose really one one, one string. Can you do a single a? B to the P, and then wait. No, that's it, perfect. You're saying, you're suggesting, single A, B to the P, B to the P, yeah. A. Uh, actually, no, that fails for the same reason. But uh, you're close. The actual string we're going to choose is going to be A to the P, B, B, A to the P. Right? So here, you pump in the middle, bad things happen. You stay in the language here, OK? Here, it's the opposite. There's just a, basically a middle delimiter. If you think of these as two balance scales, you pump on the number of A's on this half, it's not going to equal the number of B's on this half. And they're far enough apart, like, it's, it's going to destroy it, right? Let me just double check, make sure. So I'm guessing it'd be like a similar, uh, like, method if you were doing odd uh, length palindromes, or right. A to P, B. A to the P. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I don't care about doing palindromes, and I'm okay with doing even length palindromes because it's uh, the like if a language is regular or non-regular, usually languages that are similar to it are also going to be regular or non-regular. So the difference between the struct there shouldn't be a DFA for all palindromes, and then like not a DFA for even length palindromes because those are related by a, a very simple concept, right? So there should be. You, and then you can use closure as well. Like you can prove even length palindromes, and then you can prove odd length palindromes, and then you can union those two unions of non regular languages. No, actually, never mind, never mind. Forget I said that. Actually, that's, that's the union of two non regular languages can be regular. Forget, forget I said that one. But 
you get what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's related. OK. Uh, so we're going to choose this s to be this. And basically, again, our bias is we choose a, number, a huge block in the front. Because x, y come in the front. We choose x, y to be here somewhere. The only way you can pump y is going to throw it off balance. That's basically the intuition. So three, uh, what's our third step? For all ways to choose, so s is equal to x, y, z. And it's just going to be the same. We're going to say x is equal to a to the r. Uh, y is equal to a to the s, subject to and I, I, z is just z is just the leftover, right? So z is just going to be a to the p minus r minus s b b a to the p. Uh, so this is going to be subject to uh, r plus s is less than or equal to p, and s is greater than zero. All right. So we really here we only have one case. Um, again, it's, and it's, it's basically almost an identical proof. Now we're going to do what? We're going to uh, choose i, right? What's the i we should choose here? Greater than 1, so like, wouldn't 2 work again? Sure, 2 would work. But just for the sake of example, I'm going to do 0. Can you not? Oh, it can't equal 1. It can't, it can't equal, equal 1. Equal so it can be 0. Recall that xz is in the language, right? You just take the loop de loop 0 times. You can't take the loop de loop once, because we already assume that's in the language. You want to show something else is not in the language. You can take it 2, 10, 100 times, p times. You can't take it 1 time, because that's, we already assumed it's in the language. You can take it 0 times. So this is called pumping down. Um, I didn't practice, actually, what happens if I pump down. I, I did it for 2. But let's see if it still works out. So if we pump down. We're going to get uh, that x, y to the 0, uh, z is just equal to x, z, which is just equal to a to the r um, no a to the s. But then z is going to be a to the p minus r minus s, b, b, a to the p. And here we get the same kind of cancellation here. So we're going to get a to the p minus s b, b, a to the p. And note uh, that this is only a palindrome. This is only a palindrome exactly when uh, s equals 0. So we see that xz is not in the language. right? There's going to be a deficiency of a's on this side. So there's only not a deficiency when s equals 0, and, but we know that s cannot equal 0 because we've removed a non-zero amount of a's from there by pumping down. So this will never equal the number of a's here. right? So uh, the halfway point is going to be, if we were to get more formal about it, like let's say this was like 10 a's. Let's say this was like 12 a's. The halfway point had like moved this way a little bit now. So now if you were to split it back up, you could say that they're not reversals of each other, because now this one begins with a B, now this one begins with an A, and this one begins, ends with a B, or you know, something like this. right? So, but it should be clear that this is never a palindrome. You could get more technical about it into the string map. So now we can conclude uh, that this language is also not regular for the same reasons the previous one was not regular. So this is a canonical uh, example of a, a non-regular language. Okay, I have two more examples for you. I'm going to try and go through them a little faster just because to show you what speed looks like. This one is the third uh, canonical non-regular language. And I'm only proving it because it's like one of the three famous ones. I think it's important. So let uh, L is equal to not WWR, but WW. W is in the star. So this is not palindromes, but just copies of strings with each other. This is not concatenation, because concatenation would be all possible pairs, kind of like a Cartesian product. This is just the pair with itself, and only exactly with itself. So again, intuition, it should be non-regular. You can imagine the DFA would have to remember arbitrarily long amounts of things, but it only has finite space, so it can't remember everything. Uh, so. It should be non-regular for the same reasons that w, w is non-regular, uh, WWR is non-regular. 
for reasons we won't talk about yet, it turns out this language, although it seems similar to palindromes, this language is actually much harder than palindromes. We'll talk about why uh, later. But it's not, it, they seem related, but this one's actually worse, it turns out. So uh, assume to the contrary, L is regular. With pumping length P, uh, choose S is equal to, and what's a good choice of S here? Did you reuse the previous one? Ah, yeah, basically. But this one's like a palindrome. We need to not be the palindrome, but WW. So you just don't flip. Oh, there. yeah. Right. So it would be uh, A to the P, B, A to the P, B, right? Um, and this one, I'll do a slightly more technical argument on, on, on this one. So we're going to choose at, then uh, for all uh, cases, S is equal to X, Y, Z. Oh, forgot to double check here. It's true here that the length of S is greater than P, right? And it's true here that S is in L, right? Those two have to be confirmed for you to do that. Did I do that here? I should have done it for this example as well, but it, it, it's, it's trivial, right? It's, this is length 2P plus 2, so it's going to be greater than P. Um, for all cases, X equals X, Y, Z. How many cases do we have? We only have one case again. X is equal to uh, A to the R. A Y is equal to A to the S. A Z is equal to A to the P minus R minus S, B, B, nope, not B, 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 uh, A to the P, B, uh, subject to oh, R plus S is less than or equal to P, and uh, S is greater than zero. So... Uh, we, get, we only have one case, so we're going to choose i. i is equal to 2 here. And we're going to get that x, y, y, z uh, is equal to a to the r, a to the s, a to the s, a to the p minus r minus s, b, a to the p, b. And this is, we're going to have our nice cancellation again. We're going to get the same thing we did originally. We're going to get A to the P plus S, B, A to the P, B. So now, this is slightly harder to argue why it's not a form WW. This one was obviously not a palindrome, but this one is not obvious. Maybe it is obvious why it isn't uh, on that side, right? So since, so since uh, S is greater than 0, we know that s is greater than or equal to 1, right? So if s is greater than or equal to 1, let's, if s was exactly 1, this would be p plus 1, and then this would be p plus 1, and then we would have this odd thing in here. So like, if what's going to happen is as this increases, the halfway point is going to be moved to this side somewhere, right? So we could say the first half must end with an A. Since by increasing the number of A's here, we move the halfway point to this side, right? So it's somewhere here. Like if I were to write this out, it'd be like A, 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 B, A, 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 B, right? So here was the previous, this, this was the old halfway point. But now if we increase the number of A's by a ton, the halfway point moves here somewhere, right? So the first half uh, must end. I'll say, I'll say now, now ends with an A, but the second half ends with a B. So uh, we note that uh, X, Y, Y, uh, Z cannot be in L, right? Because now it's not W, W. The W, the first W doesn't equal the second W, so they can't be the same. Uh, done. So that was kind of, I think, a faster uh, proof. 
Right. And I have one more to, for you to do. These three were all kind of similar. I'll keep the formula up there. We'll do one more over here. This one's an odd one. It's going to be uh, L is equal to 1 to the n squared and is a natural number. So before we've done binary languages, like with A's and B's, we're doing a unary language here. It's the lengths of strings who are squares. So like 1, 1 to the 4, 1 to the 9. Strings who are powers, not powers of 2, but squares. And it's kind of funny that this is like a not regular language just because the linear version of it, like 1 to the n, is just one star, right? So 1 to the n is regular, but 1 to the n squared is not regular, right? So this is kind of an interesting language. It's not like as famous as the other three, but it's still an interesting example. Uh, so let's just, let's just go through the proof mechanically. Assume to the contrary, L is regular. With pumping length t. Okay. Uh, now we're going to choose s is equal to what? What's cool about unary languages is you don't get to choose the s. The s just chooses itself for you. You just choose one to the p squared. I mean, what other string could you choose? Can, you, can someone think of another string that's not 1 to the p squared? 1 to the square root of p squared. p has to be a natural. So then you would take 1 to the square root of the floor of the square root of p squared or oh, something like that. that could this. be like less than, right? What? If you take the floor, then that could just be less than size p. But yes. If you take the ceiling. Uh, you, yeah. Something like this. So like, you don't want to choose something real complicated. You want to choose something nice and that's simple. Is it true that s is an l? Yes. Is it true that uh, at the length of s is greater than 0? Also yes. So uh, what are our cases uh, for uh, s is equal to x, y, z? We have, s, we have x is equal to 1 to the r. Uh, y is equal to 1 to the s. Oh, I've been using s twice. Um, here, I'll do a, b. I just noticed that. Using s for the string and s for the length of y. OK, s. Uh, a e x equals 1 to the a, y equals 1 to the b. Then z must equal uh, 1 to the p squared minus a minus b. We're going to choose, oh, subject to, excuse me, a plus b uh, is less than or equal to p, and b is greater than 0. So those, those two things we uh, are subject to on our a and b. Um, so we're going to choose i is equal to 2. And i equals 2 is always an, is a nice obvious choice. It's just really easy. It's the second one, closest one to 1, so it's the least writing it to do. So then this is going to be x, y, y, z is equal to uh, 1 to the a, 1 to the b, 1 to the, 1 to the b, 1 to the p squared minus a minus b. I think that's right. And then that's going to be equal to 1 to the p squared plus b, right? So we want to show this is, this is either in or not in the language, right? So we're going to first do some properties, just some number some properties, and like little trivial things about math. So uh, since a b is greater than 0, p squared plus b is greater than 0. Excuse me, p squared plus b is greater than p squared. Agree? If p squared is greater than 0, p squared plus b is greater than p squared, strictly greater than. Uh, since a plus b is less than p, less than or equal to p, b is less than or equal to p, you believe that. If the sum of two things is less than a number, then one of those things is also less than a number. Maybe not strictly. a is allowed to be 0, by the way. B is not. A has to be greater than equal to zero, though, 
right? E, B like, cannot be zero. No, A has to be greater than or equal to zero. Yes, so. these are all lengths of strings, so they're natural numbers, right? Um, so if this is true, then we know that P squared plus B is, is less than or equal to P squared plus P. Just adding that to both sides, right? Then, uh, but we know that p squared plus b is strictly less than p squared plus p plus p plus 1. It's strict because p plus 1 is non-zero. We're assuming the DFA has more than one state, more than zero, more than negative one states, right? So it's going to be exactly 1, okay? What is p squared plus p plus p plus 1? Plus 1 whole squared? Yes. Right, do you guys see that? This is just um, p. I'll write that. Part. This is just going to be p squared plus two p plus one, which is just equal to uh, p plus one squared. Right. So we we actually get the fact that uh, the length of one to the p squared is strictly less than the length of 1 to the p squared plus b, which is strictly less than uh, 1 to the p, p plus 1 squared. What is the contradiction here? Let's see if you... Why is this a contradiction? Because it states that p squared plus b is a perfect square, but it's in between like two numbers Different by one, so. You guys see that? You guys get that? It's in between two consecutive squares. So it can't be a perfect square. It can't be a perfect square if it's in between two of them, right? If it, P and P squared, P, excuse me, P squared and P plus one squared are consecutive. They come next, four and nine. There is no perfect square that comes between four and nine, or nine and... 16. 16 is four squared. Yeah, nine and 16, right? So there's no, this is exactly between them. And actually, it was a good thing we chose i equals 2 here. If we chose a bigger i, we might have a more complicated argument. So i equals 2 is usually a safe bet. Following this, we get to see that uh, x, y, y, z is not in L. So just to just write a p plus b is never a perfect square. Oh, OK. Yeah. So x, y, z is not an L, so L is not regular. Great. All right, that's it. That's everything I have for today. Wait, so I have a question.